January 2021, Dover. Customs controls on the border between the UK and the EU for the first time in 28 years. Although a last minute trade deal has avoided total chaos, this is a hard Brexit. Much harder than the Brexit that was promised to the British people back in 2016. During the referendum, they all said, no, 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 it's not a hard Brexit what we want. The experts agree that this Brexit will cause economic damage to both sides. Even the government in London expects a major slump in the British economy. How did it come to this? It's becoming more and more clear. Hard Brexit was a well-planned coup. The concept of Brexit that was about let's get back control of our borders, take back control of our fishing, they kind of got hijacked. But who did want a hard Brexit? And who stands to profit from it? There's a clear ideological driving force here, which is around a desire for a very low tax, low regulation economy. Now, the problem is, is that it's not what a lot of people who voted for Brexit want. This film tells the story of how a small group from the heart of the British establishment hijacked the Brexit course to pursue their own radical agenda. We start our journey in Glasgow. The investigative journalist Peter Gagan has spent years looking into how money influences British politics, with a particular focus on Brexit. What we saw in the Brexit referendum and its aftermath is that abuses of electoral law, small amounts of targeted money, anonymous donations can really, really change the political landscape in really, really radical ways. And how exactly does that work? So Britain is really like America when it comes to politics and money. But it's a big difference. In America, it costs millions and millions and millions of dollars to influence politics. In Britain, it costs only a fraction of that. A few thousand pounds here, a few tens of thousand pounds here, have a far bigger impact than I think many people will be able to imagine. Back in 2016, the leading figures of the Brexit campaign, Boris Johnson and Nigel Farage, won the referendum with big promises for ordinary people. If we vote Leave on June the 23rd, we can take back control of 300... More money for the NHS. ...and spend on our national health service. Less immigration. And more fish. The fish stocks are in our territorial waters, and if we vote for Brexit, we'll save this industry. But despite the populist slogans, investigative research has since shown that the Leave campaigns were financed by over £18.3 million from rich donors. The UK has voted to leave the European Union. The result of the referendum was tight. 52% voted for a break with the EU. The sun has risen on an independent, united kingdom. And just look at it, even the weather's improved. But for many of the rich supporters of Brexit, the vote was not the end of their campaign, but the beginning. They began a bitter fight to shape Britain's exit from the EU according to their own agenda. They needed working class votes. They needed people who were angry at the system to win a referendum. But to construct their vision of post-Brexit uh, Britain, they didn't need that anymore. Shortly after the referendum, optimism reigns. The new prime minister, Theresa May, is confident that her government can deliver on the will of the people. Brexit means Brexit, and we're going to make a success of it. For a long time, this slogan remains empty of meaning. But soon, it's time to give Brexit a more concrete definition. That, I think, is an uh, important step forward. I'm pleased we're able to do it. The minister uh, from May's um, cabinet has agreed to, to reveal so to us what happened been... behind closed doors. David Gork was a member of the government that was tasked with developing a detailed plan for Brexit. I served as one of the 20 or so cabinet ministers that was around the table when we were making decisions 
as to how we tried to deliver Brexit in the best way possible. There were two incompatible objectives. One was to try to maintain good access to European markets. And then on the other hand, you had this desire to take control of our laws completely unimpeded by the European Union. In summer 2018, May called her cabinet to her countryside residence, Chequers, for decisive talks. It will be the site of the first showdown of a brutal inner party battle. I remember a sort of swelteringly hot day. We all arrived there in the morning. For May's then Foreign Minister Boris Johnson, it will be the last cabinet meeting before he turns against his party leader. This was clearly going to be the big meeting. There was a lot of media build up. There was a lot of talk, you know, will there be rows, will there be splits? At the meeting, Theresa May presents her cabinet with a compromise solution. The Chequers plan would put an end to unlimited immigration from the EU, delivering on the most popular promise of the Brexit campaign. But she also wants to retain a close trade relationship with Europe, which would mean Britain having to stick to many EU rules, a so-called soft Brexit. Well, in detailed discussions today, the Cabinet has agreed our collective position on the future of our negotiations with the EU, and I look forward to it being received positively. The EU's Brexit coordinator is relieved. Two years after the referendum, there's finally a concrete proposal on the table. The main message was uh, we, from the British side, want a, a reasonable uh, agreement, not only on trade, but also on other, uh, in other fields, cooperation in other fields. There was a very constructive atmosphere in the beginning of these negotiations and certainly under Theresa May. Yeah. But May's plan triggers a huge rebellion within her own party. For Tory hardliners, having to stick to EU regulations would be a betrayal of the Brexit referendum. In short, we are going to be rules takers. We are going to be a de facto colony. A smooth and orderly exit is what business wants and I'm sure what citizens want up and down this country. The hardliners accuse May of surrendering to the EU. The House of Commons has never, ever surrendered to anybody, and it won't start now. Within the Conservative Party, you, you already had this group called the European Research Group, the ERG, that was made up of those who were uh, staunch Brexiteers. They were, in many respects, a party within a party. They were in no mood to compromise as far as they were concerned. Leaving the European Union meant we set our own laws without exception. And so as things progressed in terms of the negotiations with the European Union, they just said, we don't support this deal. The leader of the ERG is Steve Baker, a radical neoliberal with close ties to the arms industry who has supported, amongst other things, the deregulation of carcinogenic asbestos. A Brexit which requires a high degree of permanent alignment to the European Union will not go through this House of Commons. It will fail. Another key ERG figure is Jacob Rees-Mogg, a wealthy aristocrat and investment banker. But why are these men pushing for a hard Brexit at any cost? The economist Francis Coppola has investigated why this issue was so important to the rebels. She has looked into the backgrounds and connections behind this group. Well, the European Research Group, as it was known, although it wasn't very European and it didn't do any research, was essentially a group um, of um, very pro-Brexit and very right-wing Tories who are ideologically wedded to the idea of Britain as this sort of free market, what they call buccaneering Britain that would go around the world striking trade deals with everybody in home and being this kind of Singapore Thames place that would be great for businesses. That term Singapore on Thames, what does that mean? I think Singapore on Thames, yeah, it's this idea, I think, that we can be this like kind of EU's offshore tax haven this island 
off the coast of the EU that could kind of undercut them in terms of tax and regulation and be kind of, in a way, rather like the way in which Singapore and Hong Kong work in the Far East, this sort of centre for deregulated finance in particular. This radicalization of a number of Brexiteers was completely against the position they defended during the referendum. Because during the referendum it was, no, don't be afraid of a Brexit, it will never be a hard Brexit. So the idea of a hard Brexit came afterwards. And then there was uh, the radical wing of the Tory party became always more uh, radical. The best known face of the radicals is Boris Johnson. At the Conservative Party conference, he makes no secret of his intention to try and take May's job. What will we hear from you today? All too soon you'll hear. This is the moment. Chuck checkers. But apart from his personal ambitions, whose interests is he pursuing with his Brexit agenda? We've never seen anybody who's raised as much money in British politics as Boris Johnson. He's had record donations even just as a backbench MP. So it wasn't a surprise to see Boris Johnson talking about deregulation, to find Boris Johnson taking up the kind of positions that all these people wanted to see. It makes me utterly furious that a UK government could even contemplate such an arrangement. Research reveals that Johnson receives large donations from businessmen who want a relaxation of laws after a hard Brexit. One of his most important donors is the British construction equipment manufacturer JCB. This great company would have to accept whatever whimsical specifications Brussels comes up with. Does that seem like a good deal to you? I don't think so. JCB's owner, Lord Bamford, is a billionaire and a member of the British House of Lords. My lords, I'm a businessman, and British businesses are certainly up to the task of making Britain a global leader in the free trade. Yeah. 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 In my he hopes for a better business environment after Brexit. Meanwhile, his shares in JCB sit in a tax haven in the Caribbean. When asked, JCB replies that the company and Lord Bamford have never made a secret of their political donations. How does a referendum, won on popular promises, turn into a campaign advocating a radical economic agenda? Guardian political journalist Sonia Soda has followed the rise of the hard Brexit faction. I think there's a very clear ideological driving force here, and that is that if you look historically in the UK, the EU has been a force for sort of driving up welfare standards and workplace standards in the UK. Now, if you're on the right, you look at that and you just think, God, this is dreadful. Like, we don't want workers to have these rights. We don't want these standards to make food safe. Um, we're interested in profit. The political leaders of Brexit are not people of the people, men and women of the people. They've been to these incredibly elite universities and I don't think that they are arguing for Brexit out of a concern for um, a lot of the people who voted for Brexit, let's say. I think the concept of Brexit that was about let's get back control of our borders, take back control of our fishing, take back control of our manufacturing, be our state be our people, which was kind of the original concept of Brexit in many, many people's minds, I kind of got hijacked by the people who said, yeah, but actually the route to prosperity is to remove all regulation, cut taxes, and let's get out there and trade with everybody, and the EU is stopping us doing that. And it kind of got hijacked. <laughs> Order! Order! When Theresa May puts her Brexit plan to a vote in Parliament, it's firmly rejected. The eyes to the right, 202. The nose to the left, 432. So the nose have it, the nose have it. But what's driving so many Tory MPs to an unprecedented rebellion against their party leader? Conservative MPs, particularly pro-EU 
Conservative MP started reporting that their constituents were getting in touch with them, saying we want a hard Brexit. And in the British system, MPs are very reactive to their constituents because that's how you get into office. You need the people in your local constituency to vote for you. So if they're sending you messages, that's going to make a lot of swivering MPs think. But actually, what looked and was supposed to be a grassroots anger at the failure to leave the European Union was all really astroturf. It was fake grassroots. Lots and lots of adverts started appearing on Facebook, targeted particularly at constituents of pro-EU Conservative MPs to send them messages to say, like, support a hard Brexit. Flooding Facebook and then, in turn, flooding MPs' inboxes with this. These were adverts that were paid for by rich, rich donors, specifically to try and push the hard Brexit agenda. You influence debate you put out adverts that will shift parliamentarians' views, try and put pressure on them, and you do it in ways that it's anonymously funded. So the only thing that you're seeing is these messages. Investigations reveal that a million pounds worth of these adverts are managed by a company called CTF Partners. CTF Partners is a London-based lobby firm that worked on Boris Johnson's earlier campaigns for mayor of London. The company also runs Facebook campaigns for the Saudi government and for fossil fuel companies. What is their role in the Brexit campaign? CTF partners did not respond to a request for comment. But the battle for hard Brexit rages not just inside Parliament. On the streets of Britain, it seems, ordinary people are now rising up against May's Theresa compromise May deal. And our Parliament are traitors. Yeah. At leave means leave marches and rallies across the country, May's deal is condemned as a betrayal of the true will of the people. But was this really an uprising of the people? Leave means leave is not a grassroots movement, but in reality a lobby firm, with huge budgets for flashy PR and loud rallies. The company is based at a building in Westminster, the former headquarters of the Vote Leave campaign, registered under the name Richard Tice. Tice, a millionaire property investor, was in the background of the Brexit campaign in 2016. And just look at it, even the weather's improved. <laughs> he is one of the rich businessmen who have huge ambitions for Britain's EU exit. That's why he's battling for a hard Brexit. Are we all enjoying the sunshine, ladies and gentlemen? Yeah. We know the sunshine's on the righteous. Yeah. Richard Tice was one of those people that during the Brexit referendum was marginal in some respects. But after the referendum, actually, Tice became more and more a kind of central figure. And he set up this um, leaves means leave movement. So he knew how to play the media. You know, a lot of online campaigning, very hardline messaging, and kind of pushing this message, you can't trust the politicians. You cannot trust the Conservatives to deliver Brexit for you. It was very populist. There was this idea that there was this terrible elite running Britain who were trying to thwart Brexit and um, that, 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 that the masses should be very, very angry about it. Surprisingly, Richard Tice agreed immediately to meet us in the office at his investment fund. We want to know what's driving him. When eventually... Uh, there was what was called the Chequers Summit. We then realised that we were being betrayed. We were still going to be subservient slaves to the bureaucrats in Brussels. That's how revolutions begin. What's your vision for Brexit, then? So having a low-tax, low-regulation, high-growth economy. Just in my industry alone, I mean, uh, which is real estate and construction, we've got all sorts of very time-consuming, very expensive EU rules on procurement. You know, this is the sort of stuff that I want to change in the way this country is run and governed. 17.4 million! We won the vote! Traitors to the country! Traitors to the country! Richard Tice brings his old friend Nigel Farage out of retirement to become the face of Leave Means Leave. 
the former bond trader is able to turn the boring details of the Brexit process into populist slogans of national pride. This is about who we are as a nation. It's about our children and grandchildren growing up being proud to be British. We will get our independence back. We will get our pride and self-respect back. We are going to win. It was a sort of political rock concert. We had colour, we had big backdrops, we had balloons, we had lights. We had, you know, it was great. And people could see that, that something was happening. But the establishment elite political class in Westminster, they didn't really wake up and smell the coffee and realise just quite what we were mobilising. The public were becoming increasingly polarised. There was a growing sense by those who were most enthusiastic about leaving the European Union that this was all a plot, if you like, that they had been betrayed, that that metropolitan liberal elite were ignoring them, that they weren't getting their way. And it was a very acrimonious time, not just in politics, but I think in the country as a whole, it was, it was pretty poisonous. I've been in Brussels watching a British prime minister reducing our nation to a state of humiliation. If they think they can walk all over us, we're going to march back and tell them, no, you can't, we will not give in. When people voted in 2016, though, well, it, it was mostly about immigration and the NHS. It wasn't about deregulation. No, I, I, I don't, don't accept that at all. Let's be very clear. What was on the ballot paper was leave. And, you know, many of us who were promoting leave, particularly the business community, we knew the, you know, the opportunities that were presented. And, of course, different people who voted to leave, you know, voted for, for different reasons. But the key theme of it was taking back control. Do you think you'll get richer because of Brexit? Um, Brexit's not about me. I haven't thought of it in those terms. But um, I do believe Brexit does present opportunities. And if, if those opportunities lead to higher growth, then everybody, literally everybody, will be better off because of Brexit. And, you know, that includes all of us. We know that people don't want more deregulation. We've seen it time and again from surveys. They don't want less social spending. They want the opposite. They want higher taxes in the wealthy. A lot of people in general want higher taxes. They want to see more regulation. They want a social net. But the way in which the Brexit referendum's aftermath has played out bears so little kind of resemblance to the popular anger that pushed it in the first place. <laughs> Under rising pressure, May brings her deal before Parliament for a second time. The nose to the left, 391. And fails again. So the nose have it, the nose have it. There wasn't a majority for a hard Brexit, and there wasn't a majority for a soft Brexit. There was a blocking majority against every option, and we were essentially stuck. The hard Brexit movement argued that this didn't need to be so complicated. Britain should simply leave the EU and stand proudly alone as a sovereign independent country, with no negative consequences. The promise was Britain should be a sovereign country like it was in the days of empire, this idea of take back control. Now the whole issue with that is that that notion of national sovereignty doesn't really exist anymore in a 21st century world. So in a world that's more globalised, where there is far, far more trade, you know, the world is becoming more interconnected. But that has never been acknowledged. The problem with being integrated into something like the EU for, for over 40 years is that all your, your business processes, your support supply chains, the way you do things, all sorts of things are, are deeply integrated with that. So unpicking that is, is a bit like kind of like trying to unscramble an omelette. But soon the complicated reality becomes clear. Guy Verhofstadt warns that there is an inevitable trade-off between Britain's freedom to change its own rules and continued access to EU trade. If you want a trade deal with the European Union, like in every trade deal, we will, as, as Europeans, uh, defend our interests. Look, we agree to have no quotas, no tariffs when we are talking about trade, but you have to accept 
uh, a level playing field. It's a word that, that, that we use every day uh, in, in these negotiations. But level playing field means that there is a fair competition uh, between us and them. State aid, climate change, social rules and so on. The British industry, like also the European industry, has an interest in having a good uh, trade relationship. Most experts predict huge damage for the British economy if Britain loses direct access to EU markets. But the supporters of hard Brexit find one man who is prepared to say the opposite. In our research, we stumble over a little-known trade expert called Shanker Singham. If you look at this problem for long enough, I think um, all, all the technical experts ultimately come to the same conclusion. You know, Shankar said, I've got a plan. And that was really important because you had economists and trade people lining up around the street after Britain left the European Union to tell them it was a bad idea. Here comes this guy who'd been to Oxford, who'd worked in America, he's telling you it's a good idea. And he became the kind of the trade guru for the Brexiteers. Well, it's been interesting watching the rise and rise of Shankar Singham because, you know, he's actually not that knowledgeable on trade. There are people out there who know much more about trade than he does, but they weren't elevated in the same way. And I can only conclude that it's because the guys who really knew about trade weren't saying the right things. They were saying, well, actually, there aren't any simple solutions. I think what Shankar was doing was saying, well, if we just do this, we can have a simple solution. Shankar Singham soon becomes known as the Brexiteer's brain. He writes a 150-page report in which he claims that the repeal of EU workplace, environmental and agricultural regulations will prove a major boost to the British economy. The ultra-conservative members of the European Research Group, including Jacob Rees-Mogg, celebrate Singham's so-called Plan A+, Plus as an alternative to May's Chequers deal. This is about how you have a fantastic Brexit. So it's a really exciting and a good paper. But who is Singham and who is financing his work? Singham works for an organization with the innocuous name the Institute of Economic Affairs. The IEA is a neoliberal think tank which supports, amongst other ideas, the privatization of the NHS as well as defending the deregulation of the tobacco industry and tax havens. The think tank also supports a hard Brexit. The think tank world was really influential in making the idea of a hard Brexit, making that seem like something that was really achievable and a good thing. Bringing what were really fringe issues in British politics, deregulation and things like that, and making them mainstream. We want to know whose interests are really being pushed by these think tanks. We find a former insider who's prepared to tell us. Shamia Sani was employed at a think tank that works closely with the IEA. He was enraged by what he experienced firsthand and decided to speak out on how these free market think tanks really work. It's an enormous network of, of right-wing lobby groups that are lobby groups, not think tanks. I know the last organization that I worked for, a donor would come in and be like, hey, I really want to, you know, I need help with whatever my salmon farms or whatever. And that lobby group will create a report around that sort of incentive from the donor. And then those reports are then taken by these think tanks to politicians and presented as legitimate um, policy suggestions, going, this is good for you, people really want this, the public really desire this, and it's good for the country. When most of the time it's purely because they've, this is the incentive of their donors. If you're a corporation, if you think about it, you know, what do you do? You've got £50,000. Do you give it to a lobbyist that's registered? Won't get you very far, might get you one meeting, it'll be registered, people will know about it. Or do you give it to a think tank to write a report? The report will get into the media, your issues will get all the way out there, and your name won't be anywhere near it. In summer 2018, a journalist from Greenpeace went undercover in the Institute of Economic Affairs to find out how think tanks offer their corporate funders influence in the Brexit process. The journalist poses as an investor in US agriculture who is hoping for a relaxation of British food standards post-Brexit in order that his hormone-treated beef can be sold on the UK market. Let me see Shankar Mark. 
He is invited to a meeting by the head of the IEA, Mark Littlewood, to explore what collaboration might look like. Delighted. Lovely to meet you. Very, very good. Thanks. Littlewood offers the journalist the chance to fund a report that will help influence British agricultural policy post-Brexit. Um, if we fully funded this, would you be able to, I mean, you know, would there be some ability to kind of make sure that they're covering the areas of specific interest? Oh, sure. And, uh, absolutely. And we're... I don't mind our donors affecting us on salience, so when we won't go as far as is them saying, we need you to reach this conclusion. Sure, not necessarily the conclusion, but to make sure that There our is substantial uh, content, fine, yeah. And that, that it's prominent and... Yeah, you will get, that would not be a worry, yeah. We can, that would not be a worry. We can do that. There is no way this report is going to say the most important thing we need to do is to keep American beef out of our market in order sure, to pop sure. up our beef farmers. Fine. It's like exactly the opposite. OK, fine. The Institute of Economic Affairs has always run on private money. They will not say where their money comes from, but we know it's private money. Occasionally, we'll get a little bit of an insight into just where some of that money might come from. So in the past, they've got money from BP, so from the oil industry, from the gambling industry, from people involved with the offshore financial industry. So really corporate interests who have very specific agendas. In Britain, there's such a huge crisis of transparency because all of these organisations don't reveal their donors. And the public are not aware of who is funding the policies that government officials are enacting or bringing forward. If you want access to government, put some money into these right-wing think tanks and then watch the entire country burn. Confronted with these statements, the IEA tells us, we do not act in the interests of our donors except to the extent that they are interested in free trade and free markets. The IEA makes independent editorial decisions and then seeks funding. It is certainly not controversial that the IEA's principles are aligned with the interests of our donors. Boris Johnson has publicly praised IEA reports on several occasions. I've just seen this stuff that's been done for the IEA, I think that's been talked about this morning. And I, looking at it, I think it's a very good piece of work. It allows us properly to take back control of our, of our laws, which you, you can't do under checkers. Under checkers, you lose control of your laws. You, your laws are made in Brussels and they're imposed on the UK. I mean, we've never had anything like that in a thousand years. So this is a very exciting way forward. But there is a very different major obstacle to a hard break with the EU. One that threatens to confront Britain with its recent bloody past. Until 20 years ago, a brutal civil war raged in Northern Ireland between those who wanted to remain part of the United Kingdom and those who wanted to join the Republic of Ireland. On Good Friday in 1998, a peace agreement was signed. It promised open borders without controls between North and South. That makes part of the peace in, in Northern Ireland, the fact that there is no longer a border. So for us, it was very important that this Good Friday agreement, that the peace in Northern Ireland is secured. And to safeguard also uh, this economic space, because there's, that's one economic space today, Ireland and, and, and Northern uh, Ireland. But a hard Brexit would threaten the promise of no border. If the UK deviates from EU rules, border controls on trade would be necessary. Hard Brexit advocates need a solution that will work even if there is a complete break with the EU. Another job for Shanka Singham, the man who seems to succeed in finding solutions to impossible problems. He is dispatched to Northern Ireland. His trip, we discover, was paid for by Prosperity UK, a private company run by a millionaire hedge fund boss. At the airport, Singham is met by Stephen Kelly, chairman of the Northern Ireland Confederation of Industry. Kelly tells us how this meeting with Singham went. First, he shows him the invisible border between Northern Ireland, part of the UK, and the Republic of Ireland. So the road we're on now, and there's dozens of informal crossings 
through farmland, through laneways. There's even a crossing within someone's house. Already, we've crossed the border once and we've just crossed it again. So the houses on the right-hand side were in the Republic, but now this business on the right-hand side is in Northern Ireland. Here we go again, just as the road changes colour here. That's the border one more time. And this business is now in Southern Ireland, but it has a gate out into Northern Ireland, and we're crossing the border once again, just now. Kelly shows his visitor from London this abandoned customs facility, the only remaining visible sign of the border that used to exist here. Singham's mission, could goods be controlled without the need for physical checkpoints like this? Their trip was largely about, is there technology that could be put in play? How do, how do we continue to have that frictionless trade that we have at the moment, from blockchain to satellites and drones and stuff being embedded in the road, linked to barcodes, and a whole raft of wild and wacky suggestions all ends up in one place, which is nothing, nothing will work. So I brought them into this very spot and I set them the challenge that whatever work they were doing on whatever alternative arrangements, it needed to meet this test. It needed to meet the fact that that person in that house 100 yards away and that person in the house another 100 yards away need to have their lives transacted in exactly the same way after Brexit as they do before. I don't think Shankar or others really understood it. So the concern is if a border is reintroduced, the partition on this island of Ireland becomes physical and manifest once again. This is a memorial to 13 people who were shot dead by the British Army in Derry on the 31st of January 1972 in an event which has been known internationally as Bloody Sunday. But it's also the place where peace was born as well. This is the thing that's so frustrating to people here, is that people far removed from here think that this is just about lines in the road, spreadsheets around trading widgets and food. But it's not. This is our, our daily life. We want to live in peace. And because Brexit doesn't have the consent of people here, that really runs the risk of actually reigniting the troubles that we had back 25 years ago. Just one week after his visit to Northern Ireland, Singham presents his privately funded report in London. This plan ignores the concerns of his Northern Ireland host and includes proposals for border controls. Singham did not respond to our request for comment. In the past, however, he has emphasized that he does not find it unusual for a think tank to become actively involved in politics. Singham's report has a huge influence on the stance of the conservative hardliners, especially the European Research Group. The ERG weren't really engaging with some of these practical problems. They weren't recognizing what some of the risks were. They were just dismissing what were you know, real problems and you know, failing to recognize that there would be consequences if we didn't properly address the issue of the Irish border. The rebels win. Theresa May's deal is rejected for a third and final time. Order! Order! The eyes to the right, 286. The nose to the left, 344. <laughs> So the no's have it, the no's have it. This result means that the UK's exit from the EU will be further delayed, creating the absurd situation that the UK will have to participate in the EU election, even though it wants to leave the EU. This gives the hardliners the perfect chance for a final attack on May's government. I think for a long time in that strange interregnum, in that strange period where there was all these battles going on in the Commons, people were wondering what Nigel Farage would do next. And we knew that the mood of the country was rapidly coming our way, big time. 
So it's all about timing and politics is all about timing. And Nigel said, the time is nearly right. Richard Tice and Nigel Farage found the Brexit party to participate in the EU election. The party styles itself as a radical alternative to the Conservatives. It has only one political goal, the hardest possible Brexit. But our research shows that the Brexit party, which claims to represent the people on the street, is anything but a people's party. The party is, in fact, a limited company run by Farage and Tice. This is not the way political parties are normally run. Normally, if you become a member of a political party, it's one member, one vote, and you get to have a say in the party. With the Brexit party, and the language they use was really interesting too, they didn't talk about members, they talked about supporters. So what would happen was you'd go on to your PayPal, you'd give the Brexit party as much money as you wanted, and you'd become a registered supporter. But that didn't give you any more say in the Brexit party than I have or anybody else. And the digital democracy that they were promising, and this is the words that Farage was using, kind of a new form of democracy, once you looked at it in any kind of depth, it was really, really hollow. So they had like an app, but the app didn't really engage people at all. It just kind of let them make comments. The Brexit party isn't really a political party. It's a, it's a company, right? Yeah, we, by you and correct, we, 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 you know, it, things were moving so quickly. You know, we just didn't have time to set up. Uh, you know, the, the uh, political party in the traditional sense of the word. So, you know, Nigel knew the right thing to do. Set it up as a company. There's no reason, you know, you're allowed to do that under the rules. That's what we did. So we both led from the front. Nigel, the campaigner, you know, the recognised voice. I wasn't really known then as an individual, as a person. You know, people say, Richard who? Um, but I was the organiser, and what I've got is an ability to make rapid-fire decisions. And so, yeah, we just, um, we just mobilised and you know, we just constantly, decision after decision, just like that. You know, because we were running basically a committee of two, it was very easy. Although there are many small supporter contributions to the Brexit party, our research shows that they are dwarfed by inflows from wealthy donors. So people like Jeremy Hoskins, who's a hedge fund guy who used to fund the Leave campaign, the referendum, had funded the Conservative Party. He donated to the Brexit Party, quite a lot of money. A man called Christopher Harborn, who'd previously given some money to Conservatives, he donated well over £10 million to the Brexit Party. It's just huge sums of money uh, for a political party. Thank you! Beat the Brexit! Thank you, Morning! Thank you! Thank you! Oh, we got this sorted! With their radical message, Tice and Farage are robbing the Conservatives of donors and voters. Nigel Farage is an outsider to the system. He sort of portrays himself as this, you know, figure who speaks truth to power, who keeps, you know, British prime ministers honest. And the role that he has always played is to put pressure on Conservative leaders, to scare them that he's going to take votes away from them and that they need to give him what he wants. The Brexit party, only a month old, challenges the 180-year-old Conservative party in the EU election campaign. You know, it's funny, isn't it? It worked. The Brexit party wins almost 32% of the vote. Oh, all the establishment, both here in the UK and over there, were aghast, utterly aghast because uh, the penny then dropped. The Brexit Party Limited enters the EU Parliament in Brussels. Their goal? To disrupt the sessions as a final insult to the hated institution. You know, I'm a, I'm a businessman. I'm a real estate guy. Uh, I'm not an experienced politician. And suddenly, all of a sudden, we were the biggest single political party in the whole of the European Parliament. And my goodness, we made a noise. There's an historic battle going on now across the West, in Europe, America and elsewhere. It is globalism against populism. And you may loathe populism, but I tell you a funny thing, it's becoming very popular. <laughs> <laughs> I know you're gonna miss us, but we're gonna wave you goodbye and we'll look forward in the future to working with you as sovereign. If you disobey the rules, you get cut off. Could we please remove the flags? But the Brexit party is not concerned with the EU parliament in Brussels. It is trying to exert influence in London, and it's succeeding. 
large numbers of Conservative voters went to support the Brexit party. And I think there was a sense of panic within the Conservative Party, reaching up to members of the Cabinet, that unless the Conservative Party, if you like, closed off this issue, unless it dealt with the threat of Nigel Farage, um, the Conservative Party was doomed. We were essentially like special forces. We launched uh, and we came out of base and we basically accomplished the mission. We were being betrayed by the elitist class and we stopped it. We stopped the great betrayal. The follow-on effect was that the day after the European elections, Theresa May knew that she was toast and she announced that she was going to step down. Never forget that compromise is not a dirty word. Life depends on compromise. Theresa May's time as Prime Minister is over, and with it, the idea of a soft Brexit compromise. And there was a belief that there was only one person who would be able to stop Nigel Farage from essentially uh, overtaking the Conservative Party, and that was Boris Johnson. People were so sick after three years of this kind of gridlock under May. They just wanted it done. Get Brexit done was a very powerful slogan. In a way, what they were doing was giving power to the simplicity. It had been about take back control. We will cut the ties to this evil empire and sail off into the sunset. It was that kind of imagery. Many moderate Conservatives have to accept that their party has changed significantly in the Brexit process. And so, to a large extent, because of fear of Nigel Farage, the Conservative Party moved to become much more like Nigel Farage by being a more populist party. So uh, I made it clear that I would resign from government because I didn't want to play any part in that. When the new Prime Minister, Boris Johnson, presents his cabinet, it is full of hardliners who are uncompromisingly for a hard Brexit. The eventual victory of Boris Johnson, his election as Conservative leader and Prime Minister, was really the ultimate victory for the money men of British politics, the kind of people who'd bankrolled the Brexit referendum, the kind of people who'd funded pro-Brexit campaigns after Brexit, the kind of people who give money to anonymously funded think tanks. For all of them, Boris Johnson was the epitome of what they wanted. They believe he's malleable, so they believe they can push him. Well, good morning, everybody, and uh, it is wonderful to see this new team assembled here. Thank you all very much. Our research reveals that Johnson, again, attracts record donations for his candidacy for party leader. He wins back to the Conservatives some of the Brexit Party's most generous financial supporters. Once again, he receives money from Anthony Bamford, the owner of JCB and CTF Partners, the firm that has supported him in previous campaigns. Largely unnoticed by the public, more than a dozen former employees of the Institute of Economic Affairs and other hard Brexit think tanks are brought into the government as advisers. Statement, the Prime Minister. to get Brexit done, and let's take this country forward. Yeah. On January the 31st, 2020, Britain formally leaves the EU. Without Nigel, as we all know, there would have been no referendum. And without Nigel, there would have been no Brexit. We become a democratic, self-governing, independent, and I hope Proud nation! Yeah. Five, four, three, two, one! We did it! 
during an 11-month transition phase in which Britain stays closely aligned with the EU, Johnson's government negotiates the concrete details of a trade deal. In the midst of the Covid crisis, an agreement is reached literally at the last minute. The deal brings relief in Brussels, even though it's an uneasy compromise. Mission accomplished. Hard Brexit has become reality. On December the 30th, 2020, Boris Johnson signs the agreement. Folks, this is it. Uh, and uh, I know the question you will all be asking yourselves is, is have I read it? The answer is yes. And it's uh, an excellent deal for this country. Thank you all very much. Thank you. I do think it's a huge mistake for the country. I think others are going to pay a very significant price for that, those who are going to lose their jobs as a consequence of it. I think the UK is a less attractive place for inward investment. And I think there are many ordinary British people, probably ordinary British people who voted to leave in 2016 and voted Conservative in 2019, who will sadly pay a price for this. Of course. There's no such thing as just getting Brexit done. Of course, Brexit and its complications are going to dominate the British political debate for the next 10 years. That's just the way it is. At the end of the day, there's still this very big question mark. What is it going to achieve apart from a lot of economic pain for the UK and a lot of hardship and poverty? How will the UK use its new freedom? Just one week after the final exit, hardliners have already called for the abolition of environmental data protection and labour laws. The battle over Brexit will continue. Only the coming years will show how much this coup by the country's rich elite will change Great Britain. I think too often we don't appreciate, we don't understand how abuse of the electoral system and abuse of the political system and the role of lobbying unchecked in politics can change and shift and kind of warp a political landscape.